Last year in the state of Arizona, over 350 tons of marijuana, cocaine, and heroin were seized in drug busts by the U.S. Customs and Border Protection. To maintain security in the area, the Air and Marine Unit used Black Hawk helicopters to hunt down criminals attempting to break into the U.S. Used by the military in Afghanistan and Iraq, these $14 million helicopters provide essential backup to the agents on the ground. The main entry point into Arizona for drug smugglers is 180 miles south of Phoenix, near the border town of Nogales. This frontier with Mexico is made up of rugged mountains and valleys that provide unlimited opportunities for Mexican drug barons seeking to move their illegal cargo north. Today, 15 miles west from the border town of Nogales, a Black Hawk has been called in to help track a drug shipment. Okay, copy, three minutes out. Everybody's running, everybody's running. Yeah, everybody's running now. A smuggler has been spotted, and the crews have been asked to land to provide much needed backup to the ground units. There was a whole bunch that ran off to the uh, northeast, correct? Northeast. Yeah, yeah 10 4. It's a highly dangerous situation. 15 suspects have been spotted, and it's not known if they are armed. The agents on board have to dismount as quickly as possible. A smaller chopper is brought in to help with the search. Try and hurry up as many as you can. I think you got one right there to the left. Most of the smugglers are hiding around the dense undergrowth. One instantly gives up the chase and surrenders with his drug load. We've already found one pack of marijuana, so we have one guy and one pack of marijuana. We still think there's more, uh, some more out there, so that's what we're gonna go do. We're gonna go supply uh, some support to the guys that are down on the ground. The helicopters stay circling above, constantly passing through information to the ground team. We have good air support right now. Uh, the air support's actually suppressing the people down. These guys won't start running. If they see the helicopter, they're not going to run. They're going to stay hidden, which actually gives the agents on the ground a tactical advantage because they won't move, so it'll give us more time to actually look for these guys. Another way that the helicopter actually helps out a lot is the fact that uh, it's blowing a lot of wind down, so it actually moves the bushes a lot and allows those pilots and the, uh, and the enforcement officers on board to actually have a better view of what's on the ground. So it's a great bird's eye view for the agents on the ground. With a possible 15 suspects still at large, Agent Jamares and the team spread out across the valley. Now what we're looking for these bricks that are wrapped in burlap. So you'll be able to see them, they're pretty big. They weigh about 40, 50 pounds each. There's no sign of the drug smugglers. It appears the suspects have fled back to Mexico, which is only two miles away. Traffic comes in from all different directions. Uh, there's numerous different trails and cuts and washes where uh, they can hide and uh, try to uh, circumvent us or go around us. So it's a challenge. It doesn't take long, though, for the agents to find part of the shipment that's been abandoned. We got several bundles of marijuana just above the hill here. We're gonna go give them a hand to move it out. As they search the area close to where the suspect was arrested, they find more and more bundles of marijuana. The loads are so heavy, they have to be rolled down to a collection point at the bottom of the valley. With this evidence, it's clear all the men spotted were drug mules, carrying 50-pound loads on their backs into the US. Mexican gangsters use young men from poor backgrounds to smuggle the drugs. They're willing to break the law and risk their lives for the $3,000 fee, a small fortune to anyone back in Mexico. Agent Jamarez gets a debriefing from the agent who originally spotted the shipment. So how far did you walk? Where'd you come from? Uh, we came from about a, a mile, mile and a quarter that way, down by the road. We parked and responded, responded over here to a highly trafficked area. Uh, when we got to the top, 
We didn't see any sign of anything, so we got we got up top to see if we could look out really well. And uh, just then, about a quarter mile off our left side, uh, we seen about 15, 15 people running down the hill. We suspected to be illegal immigrants. Uh, come to find out that they were backpackers. And how many packs do we have? We got about 15 right now, and uh, it looks like possibly 16. The team has put a lot of effort into today's bust, some having had to spend a week sleeping rough on the trail of this group. The suspect is let off, and the marijuana is loaded onto the Black Hawk. It's never a mundane changes every day that you're out here. As you can see, some of the landings that we did today were pretty interesting. Most times you wouldn't get anybody to land in some of these places. So that adds a little bit of excitement to it. It's such a large hole that there's not enough room in the Black Hawk for the agents, suspects, and the drugs. It looks like we're going to have to take uh, two loads out, two uh, shots of taking the dope out, and we'll take the suspect and the agents back out also because it's a long ways for them to get back to their vehicles. Probably take us two trips to get this size of a load out. We could take it all out if we took all the back seats out, but we really don't want to do that. We'll just make two, two trips. Uh, it could even be three trips with all the agents that we have and the suspect that we have to haul out. So I mean, we'll get everybody out of here. That's what's nice about this thing. It's kind of like a truck. Last year, the Air and Marine Unit assisted in the apprehension of over 1,500 narcotic smugglers and 590 tons of marijuana. Today's operation has taken up a lot of time and manpower. Most of the smugglers managed to escape, but the agents are pleased with what they see as a successful conclusion to the day's events. It's a great catch, um, obviously. 15, 16 bundles uh, at over 500, 600 pounds plus, um, with street value of about 800 US dollars per pound. So, um, very great catch you know, in terms of uh, uh, apprehension. Uh, we also have one suspect apprehended and uh, plenty of drugs off the street, which is great. Coming up, the Maricopa County deputies uncover a human smuggling cell. Well, well, out of the house, we've got 506, but we've got about another 405 in a minivan we think we're being delivered. Illegal immigration is big business for the Mexican drug gangs, who control the trafficking routes into the United States. Each year, an estimated 20,000 immigrants enter the U.S. illegally through the state of Arizona, having to pay the gangs up to $9,000. As the number of illegals increases, the Maricopa County Sheriff's Office has set up the human smuggling unit to fight the crime. Every day, illegals are shipped north in small groups along the major highways. Today, Sergeant Brett Palmer is on patrol on Interstate 17. He's had a call from deputies nearby that they've stopped a suspicious vehicle. One of our units up here on I-17 made a traffic stop south of New River, and uh, they just confirmed over our radio that it's going to be confirmed uh, human smuggling. Living. On arrival, Sergeant Palmer finds that the deputies have pulled over a suspected load vehicle. These are people carriers that are used by smugglers to transport illegal immigrants across the country. The arresting deputies have questioned the occupants and are not convinced of their story. They're all, they're all sticking to the story that they're going to pick uh, melon, cantaloupe, melones in Spanish. How funny, they're all going towards Miami or New York, and then they're all melon pickers from California. Hey, Rocky, is this the second or the third time we've heard this story tonight? The second time? Second time. They're coming from a certain area down south of here. They're all buddies going up to the same... Lieutenant area. Joe Souza, who leads the human smuggling unit, is also on the scene. The deputies have told them of further evidence, which leads them to believe this is a load vehicle. The reason why the vehicle caught his attention is because it was riding high. It was actually riding high and bouncing around. What did they do to that vehicle? They put air shocks in it now, so when they overload the 
the vehicle with people, they can put air in the shocks and bring it up. They overcorrected. They drew the deputy's attention. So based on that overcorrection, he got in behind the developed probable cause, which was speeding. And, uh, and we pulled nine people out of the vehicle that was only designed to transport six. The suspects are cuffed and lined up. A larger vehicle is called in, as there are too many suspects to transport in just the deputy's cars alone. The odd thing about it is it's the second time we've heard that exact same story tonight. I mean, the same as in same location, going to the same thing, coming from the same area. So it's too coincidental for us in this line of work. And in a few hours from now, we'll uh, put them in interview rooms, try to go at each one individually a little bit more uh, through uh, interview techniques and see if we can't get any of the break. This is a successful bust, but it's not unusual. In the last two years, the unit have stopped over 120 load vehicles. Okay. It's a load vehicle, we know that. Yeah, it's a load. Yeah, okay. Uh, we'll try to break them in the interview room tonight. Okay. If the smugglers manage to get their human cargo past the Maricopa County deputies, they are then taken to temporary addresses, known as drop houses, before they're moved to larger cities all over the US. The next day, the smuggling unit are acting upon information they have received from illegal immigrants they have apprehended and questioned. A number of properties have been identified as possible drop houses. Everybody's prepping their gear, basically a gear check, make sure everybody's ready to go. Guys that are assigned to have long guns will break out the long guns. It's imperative that we bring long guns on this so we make sure we have fire supremacy if something does go down. Because we've dealt with these before, we got to make sure we bring the tools. You do not bring a handgun to a rifle fight, you will lose. The team plan to visit each property on their list to conduct what they call knock and talks. For Lieutenant Joe Souza, this is good old fashioned police work. This is part of my job that I absolutely love is going in the field with the guys. It's in my blood. I love to go out. I love to get into stuff. It's I'm a cop. That's it'll always be in my blood. Last night I was just excited. Just to come out knowing that we might get into something good made me really happy. I was actually bouncing around the house and my wife's like Oh, you're going to be in the field tomorrow, aren't you? I go, oh, I'm going to try. I'm going to try, because she knows. Without a search warrant, the deputies will literally knock on the door of the property and attempt to gain entry without a fight. It's a risky strategy, as they never know what to expect. The team approach the first property and find two people outside. Two of my guys made soft contact with them, advised them why we were here, what we're looking for. Uh, they immediately gave us consent to enter the house, just take a quick look around. Nothing suspicious is found, so the deputies move on to investigate the other locations. Sheriff's office! They usually park here? Three have made contact at the second one is code four. Okay. There's obvious indicators that we look for on a drop house. The indicators don't exist here on the inside. Um, nothing that we're looking for. It's a painstaking game of cat and mouse for Lieutenant Souza and his men. We should be seconds out from this. Most properties are not used for more than 30 days by the Mexican criminal gangs. This is the last address from the list their informants have given them. On arrival, the unit find a man coming out of the suspected drop house. You live 123. See, in my, my who's, who's in there? Rocket, nothing. Can you open it? Okay. The hands off approach works with no weapons drawn and no search warrant. The man gives consent for the police to enter his house. Once inside the property, the deputies are immediately suspicious. It's not clear who the owner is or how many people live there. The dirt marks on the wall and the lack of furniture indicate to Joe that this could be a drop house. Any signs? Yeah. So all, all the other rooms, no furniture except for a bed. How about, you got any dirt marks on at the bottom? It's dirty. So we've got obvious signs of a drop house. 
This is the only room that's furnished. All the other rooms, nothing except one room with the mattress. He's got the dirty signs along. So there's been numerous people here. It's clean though, right? The deputies have information that the adjoining apartment is also a possible drop house. When questioned, the occupants are vague about who lives there. The deputies are given permission to enter the house. After a short search, they find a group of men hiding out the back. With none of the men able to produce identification, the unit have enough evidence to arrest the group on suspicion of being in the country illegally. Outside in the driveway, Joe has found what seems to be a load vehicle. We got four or five in his van right here. I don't know if it was just being delivered. We got lucky. It's got, it's got Arkansas plates on his vehicle here. No one in the van has valid identification, and they keep changing their answers when questioned about why they are here. The deputy isn't convinced they are in the U.S. legally. In the two apartments, they find further evidence. A ledger with names with what looks like the amounts people have paid to be smuggled into the U.S. After a long shift, Joe calls in the results to the deputy chief. Out of the house, we got 506, but we got about another four or five in a minivan we think were being delivered. We still have to confirm that. If we can uh, distinguish some coyotes, then we'll have some state charges. <laughs> All right, bye-bye. The knock and talks have proved a success, with one smuggling cell having been discovered and one smuggler, or coyote as they are called, arrested. Well, we've... Uh got one guy separated inside. We've pretty much identified him as the coyote, and he is starting to give us some information now, slowly but surely, so we're gonna get him out of here and interview him further and, and see if there's anything, anything still coming to this location. Uh, we'll make a determination whether it's worth even watching, see if anybody shows up. We have been here for a while, a lot of eyes on, or is there any other houses he can take us to or lead us to? In the last year, the human smuggling unit have arrested 28 coyotes for kidnapping, extortion, murder, and aggravated assault. Today, out of the nine suspects arrested, three face state charges of human smuggling. The rest were booked as co-conspirators. Coming up, SWAT disrupt an identity theft and forgery ring. The average person will look at this and think it looks pretty harmless. I don't think it looks harmless at all. More than a million Mexicans attempt to illegally enter the U.S. each year. Many are smuggled by criminal networks into Arizona, where they are provided with fake papers before they're shipped north. As a result, for the past five years, the state has been the identity theft capital of the US. Today, the Maricopa County Sheriff's Office is conducting a special operation to smash a human smuggling and ID forgery ring. A six-month surveillance operation will culminate in two SWAT missions today. A vehicle assault to apprehend the gangsters in a public car park, along with a raid on a home address. The vehicle assault will take place first. Lieutenant Joe Souza from the Specialized Human Smuggling Unit is working together with SWAT on this mission. Yesterday we made a buy from this uh, bad guy who made a legal permanent resident card, which is basically like a green card, and a social security number, uh, social, social security card for our undercover. 
Today, what, what we're going to do is we're going to purchase an Arizona driver's license from the same sus suspect. And if that happens, then we're going to take them down in the parking lot and, and serve two warrants at two different houses we know this guy frequents and goes to. Joe knows this is a potentially very dangerous operation. Just based on doing the first buy with our undercovers, we noticed counter surveillance. The bad guys were actually driving into the parking lots ahead of time looking for us. So it was something we had to really pay attention. It's the same thing that drug dealers do. Human smugglers, drug dealers, they all carry guns, and that's why we have a tactical team here. As the arrest will be made in a public area, SWAT rehearse their vehicle assault several times before they leave. He's seeing what's inside of this vehicle. If he thinks he can keep a better eye by coming here and looking, fine. And the main things about a vehicle assault is you want a surprise. We throw a distraction device to turn their attention in the opposite direction that we're coming from. And also, you want to breach those windows quick. All teams move now. All teams move. To minimize danger to the public and to themselves, each SWAT deputy meticulously runs through their role in the operation. The team have to make sure they apprehend the suspects as quickly as possible. Don't worry about this window. Worry about hitting down there. You want to hit the frame. Right. And you'll break it with no problem. We've learned out of experience and uh, many trial errors that uh, this works really good for a lot of reasons. It's really light. Um, it's aluminum. So when we hit the windows, it actually shatters it. Um, it's, I mean, it's pretty safe, and most of all, the size is really compact, so this is what we use on our vehicle assaults. The unit moved towards the rendezvous point, where the undercover officers have arranged to meet and purchase fake papers from the dealers. I have mobile units stating that they saw the Impala go into the parking lot. Does the eyes on see that? From our vantage point, it looks like there's probably two subjects in the vehicle. Okay, and do we see any counter? We're currently one street west. An unmarked police car is also tracking the suspects every move as they too approach the meeting point. Okay, the vehicle is on the move. It is uh, headed out towards Southern from the Turner Park. There he is. There he is. Right there. Pulling into the, parking lot. the undercover officer signals that the deal has been done and calls SWAT in. Go ahead and take down. Contact has been made. Go ahead and take down. Go, go, go. The three SWAT 4x4s moving quickly, converging in the car park and surrounding the suspect's vehicle. As they draw up, the undercover cops back away from the scene, allowing the armed deputies to launch their assault. Distraction devices are thrown, and the windows are breached. The aggressive tactics have worked perfectly. Completely overwhelmed, the suspects are so stunned they do not attempt to retaliate or escape. The men are arrested and booked on charges of running a criminal forgery and identity theft operation. We ready? Let's get up. With the first part of the operation completed, Rico kits up for the raid on the home address. From their intelligence, they know this is where the forgery ring was run from. We gotta do it kind of fast because we don't want the intel to get out to the trailer park to start uh, destroying any evidence that we might need. So we're gearing up kind of quick, getting ready, and uh, gonna go hit it. The team is given news that this isn't going to be a straightforward raid. Even though there may be other members of the criminal operation at the address, there are reports family members of the suspects live there too. Latest uh, information, uh, the target houses, we definitely have uh, 
uh, people inside. It's, uh, I think it's determined that there's, uh, I think, children and uh, maybe a female inside. So uh, that kind of did uh, it switch. It changes what we do a little bit uh, for their safety. Obviously, when there's kids involved, we want to make sure that they're okay. So uh, we're going to shift our tactics a little bit, uh, but we'll still be all right. Judging the right amount of force needed when serving residential warrants against dangerous criminals is a difficult scenario SWAT face daily. All right, guys, about 15 seconds. Drop us off at this empty, empty lot right here. Right here? Yeah, right here. This mount. Breaches on my side, this side. With no answer, the deputies at the front break in through the front door. The intelligence SWAT received before the operation is accurate. In the first bedroom, they find a woman and child hiding in a cupboard. Both visibly scared and distressed, the deputies make sure they are let out of the house safely. I just want to walk out. Come on. Come on. With the property cleared of suspects, a thorough search for evidence is conducted. Good, Gary. The ID in here. At the back of the trailer, equipment used to forge identity is found. You got all like pictures laid out, computer, printer, uh, first room. Advise, uh, Thousands of fake IDs are found. All the evidence is collected and taken away to be used in the case against the two suspects arrested earlier. The first room to our left, we found basically all the fraudulent documents, the printer, the, the pictures, the computer, all kinds of cutouts where they've been like making false documents, and this is where we're at now. This is one of Maricopa County's largest ever ID theft busts. Tonight, Maricopa County Sheriff's deputies arresting five men accused of running an identity forgery ring. Deputies say the five were all in the U.S. illegally. They tell us they got a tip and ran a surveillance operation for about six months before breaking up the ring. They say the men were providing undocumented immigrants fake IDs to get a job in the U.S. Deputies also found hundreds of fake social security cards and illegal weapons. Back at the headquarters, Joe Souza from the human smuggling unit assesses the hall. I can connect this to human smuggling because we found ledges uh, cataloging thousands and thousands of dollars, listing people going to New York, California, and Nevada. So we know they were involved in human smuggling. And if you look at some of these, uh, these driver's licenses and some of these California driver's licenses and the legal permanent resident cards, they're, they're, they're high quality. They look very, very good. You would need a very trained eye uh, to pick up on this stuff. So the average person will look at this and think it looks pretty harmless. I don't think it looks harmless at all. People will say white collar crime, ID theft, paperwork. But look what you have here. You've got a bunch of shotgun shells, slug shells. You've got a, a, a pistol. We could have very easily, on a white collar crime, uh, got fired up at the door and lost deputies. So I don't, I don't look at it as harmless. In Arizona last year, Almost 1.2 million hours were spent by victims trying to recover and repair their identities at a staggering cost of $147 million. And then it takes people years to clear, clear up identity theft. You got the IRS coming after you, creditors coming after you. So it, it's, it's not a victimless crime. There's tons of victims out there. We'll be working on this for years. Coming up, the sheriff's assault a drug dealer's house in a dangerous Phoenix neighborhood. Take it, take it, take it. You need to come out of the house. You need to do it now with your hands up. Yeah. Okay. 
180 miles south of Phoenix is the town of Nogales. Divided in two by the border with Mexico, it's the favored point of entry for illegal immigrants wanting to get into the US. The division between the two countries is marked by a 15-foot high fence designed to keep drug traffickers and illegals from getting any further north. There are an estimated 460,000 illegal immigrants in Arizona alone. Nogales Police Department are on the front line of this war, having to be on the lookout for people smugglers and criminals trying to evade capture. Almost makeshift in parts, Officer Leslie Dominguez has to check the barrier each day for signs of activity. Okay, what we have here is a hole on the fence. Um, pretty much what happens here is um, we get illegal aliens crossing into the U.S. and we also get a lot of uh, drug smuggling. It typically takes uh, about 10 to 15 minutes for them to cut the hole. As easy as that, they just look in through the hole, see if everything's clear, and then they cross back in. This urban area makes Nogales an attractive place to cross for illegals, as it's a quick and safe route for them to negotiate. The barrier here bears the scars of repeated attempts of those trying to break into America. As you can see, there's different patches, different layers where Border Patrol has actually had to come and, and cover holes that they've already dug into. Lookouts are here 24-7. They normally just sit on the hill and just watch what we're doing, especially now that there's a hole here. They're probably seeing, you know what, it's being uh, surveillance, so they're letting their people know, you know what, you can't cross into the U.S. or you can't move uh, the drugs. Mexicans who make it through the fence and past the Nogales PD are not home and dry. The U.S. Border Patrol have spent $1 billion in the past year on smart surveillance along the frontier. Today, Agent Jamares of Customs and Border Protection is on line watch, as it's known, monitoring any suspicious movements in the Nogales area. We're actually in the radio room, which also houses the uh, remote video surveillance system that we use down here in Nogales. Uh, basically what it is, it's a series of cameras that are stationary along the border that allows agents to actually uh, have day daytime capabilities in order to see, as what we're seeing on the screen right now, as well as uh, nighttime capabilities, and which is basically a thermal camera, which will go ahead and give us the ability to heat any uh, heat signatures out there. The agents are Meandis 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year, and uh, they've proven to be very effective in the, uh, in the enforcement effort along the border. Every day, Border Patrol apprehends over 2,000 people trying to enter the country illegally. The cameras have spotted two men, who agents believe have breached the fence. The surveillance center relays the coordinates to a team on the ground, who stopped the suspects near the barrier. The agents take no chances and search the suspects. They cannot be sure they are not drug mules or even coyotes, the term used to describe a people smuggler. It's clear from the search that the men have little money and few belongings, leading the agents to believe their story that they are economic migrants. The migrants reveal they paid a people smuggler to help them over, but were separated from their group. The men reveal they would have had to pay another fee to the smugglers on arrival to Chicago. 
¿Cuál era iba a ser el último precio que iban a pagar en cuanto llegaran ahí? Porque normalmente estas cosas se, se le paga dinero. Sí. No es gratis. Sí, son okay. 1800. 1800? Sí. Okay. Abandoned by their smuggler, the men have survived living rough around the inhospitable border area. For Agent Jamares, this is not an uncommon story. The criminal gangs routinely dump their human cargo if they think they're holding them back. We see this a lot. The smugglers, you know, they don't care about the lives. They care about the profit. So if the two individuals can't keep up, they'll, they're willing to drop them off so that they can continue and make more money off the individuals that can't continue. In this case, eight other people that were able to continue with the guide. The men's epic journey will end here. They've traveled a thousand miles and lost $1,300, almost half a year's wage for some back in Mexico. They will now be fingerprinted and deported. Every year, Mexican mafia gangs traffic narcotics worth billions of dollars across the border into the USA. In South Phoenix, battling the drug gangs falls to the Maricopa County SWAT team. Today, the team have been asked to serve a warrant on two houses known to be used by drug dealers in a particularly dangerous neighborhood. Um, but this is the house here, and this is our guy. Jesus Moreno Hernandez, he goes by Chuco, and he's been arrested 32 times from dangerous drugs, sales, aggravated assault on a police officer. His criminal history is like a book in here. But he's got There's intelligence that the criminals use CCTV cameras to monitor the area around the properties. Uh, a Quest guy went in to fix the phone, and when he left, he went to the PD and he, and he wrote this up. Chuco has a portable TV set on top of the dresser located on North Wall. It's a surveillance monitor used to monitor the front yard, driveway, and street, and the, and the monitor also has sound. With this information, deputies Rico and Sanchez have to work undercover to come up with a plan of attack on the property. It's pretty dangerous because uh, this is a really, really bad area. It's a high gang, high drug, high weapon traffic area. So obviously, this is exactly what we're serving a search warrant for, it's drugs and weapons. We have intel that there's three-point surveillance on this house, so that makes it extremely difficult to do our standard uh, drive-bys on the house. So I'm going to go in plain clothes. Just as you see me now, I guarantee you they're watching. As they enter the neighborhood, the officers take every precaution not to be discovered. Did you put your camera down? Oh, he's watching me hard, man. Watching everywhere, huh? Rico gets out the car and begins his recon mission, trying to act as normal as possible. Sanchez drives round to the prearranged pickup point. And only 10 minutes later, Rico calls to check in. Yeah, it drove by us twice. Yeah, hey, that great truck passed by Rico three times. The team believe they themselves are being tracked. There was a truck that kept circle in the area. Uh, it passed me three times. I think it passed you guys twice. Um, so that's kind of uh, not normal for this area. But uh, there was a lot of people out, a lot of people in their front yards, a lot of people walking. So I think we blended in pretty well. Later that night, after the team have been debriefed by Rico, they get kitted up and head out to hit the address. As the suspects have their own surveillance cameras, SWAT will hit the properties hard and fast to take them by surprise. We're going to be about 30 seconds out to target, 30 seconds. Before the people in the house can react, the team smash and rake the windows. Take it, take it, take it. You need to come out of the house. You need to do it now with your hands up. 
family living at the property are brought out. Hey, Glenn, we got the 101 coming right behind us. Stay behind me. This way. The suspect is still unaccounted for, so SWAT enter the house to search the property thoroughly. In the living room, Rico discovers a large cache of weapons. There's guns everywhere. Guns on the wall, everywhere. So guy come through that door. The team move on to the property next door. The main suspect isn't found, but they do find his associate hiding from the deputies. He's also wanted on a drug-related warrant and is arrested. Dude, why would we do anything for you when you leave, when you leave your daughter and your old lady over there, okay? Let's get him outside. Stand up. Despite not being able to apprehend the main suspect, it's a good catch for the Maricopa County SWAT team. If we start picking off drug dealer by drug dealer and put them through the system, we're putting a little notch in the big scheme of things. You have choices. You've chosen to be a drug dealer, all right? We've chosen to be law enforcement, all right? This war goes on in the world when it comes to drugs. Will we ever stop it? Who knows? We encounter it every single day, and uh, that's uh, unfortunately the nature of our business. There's no end in sight in the war against drug dealers and people smugglers, but this is another small victory for those on the front line, risking their lives every day protecting America.